Good morning. morning. Running a little late because I was running my mouth, but that should be no surprise to any of you. But I hope you've had a good weekend, and uh, we ran down to uh, to see my mother over the weekend and spent a little time, and we enjoyed that. But uh, uh, we, as all of y'all know, getting over uh, COVID and everything over the last week, I had Coley for the beginning of the week before he could go back to to his school, and uh, uh, we were rolling down the road and. Uh, and every once in a while I'll sing, and the boys like to tell me to, to be quiet. And uh, I was singing that, that old song, Hilda, you know that song, Like a Lighthouse? You know, there's a lighthouse on the hillside. And I was singing that, and he said, there isn't no lighthouse around here. That, I don't see no lighthouse. I said, you little smart aleck, be quiet. But I took him to get a haircut, and uh, uh, he went to singing, and I tried to do the same thing for him, but it didn't work out the same way. Uh, I've enjoyed just getting to spend time, uh, you know, I don't know what it is. Sometimes we need to slow down, and every once in a while the Lord will send something to, to help us do that. And, and uh, But I enjoy getting to spend time with, with my boys through, uh, even if it was because of COVID-19. And it's always good to, to take a breath and, and pay attention to what's really important and uh, so there's blessings in everything. Uh, there's blessing in, in even the, the tough stuff of life. And uh, so I hope that, that we'll all be looking for it. And it won't take COVID-19 for, for the Lord to get your attention. But uh, I'm thankful this morning that we had a good turnout for Sunday school. And uh, the, the new uh, ladies class, it sounded like y'all were having a good time in here. Uh, doing the Armor of God by Priscilla Shearer. And if you don't know, Priscilla Shearer is, is the daughter of Tony Evans, who uh, he's a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, just a, 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 really, uh, a really good uh, pastor and, and teacher and uh, was uh, one of the guys that, uh, a fellow that I've always admired, Howard Hendricks, uh, really mentored, and, and uh, I think a lot of, of him. Uh, so, uh, and his daughter is, is just as, as good, but, uh, we've got several things going on. Um, our Wednesday night services started back last Wednesday and we, we had a meal here prepared and hopefully, uh, next go around, we'll have plenty more of you that are willing to come, come out and enjoy that. And we want these Wednesday nights, uh, these family night and, and the other Wednesdays of the month. If you're part of a, uh, a committee. Uh, and especially uh, committees that, that just around the corner, you know, we're, we're pulling in to, to March. I mean, we're already about halfway through February, uh, and we've got committees that need to get work done for uh, the upcoming church year. So uh, these Wednesday nights are opportunities for you to have committee meetings uh, for our missions organizations, Baptist men, WMU, uh, hopefully see RAs and GAs maybe uh, crop back up, but at any rate, our, our youth program uh, to, to get moving, whatever you're a part of, whether it's fellowship, et cetera, these are opportunities for you to have meetings and, and uh, for us to uh, facilitate that in, in a better way and, and give you an opportunity through the week that would otherwise be occupied by something else. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we have information for you. Uh, about these things coming up. We want you to get your home lives, mature livings, all of that kind of stuff out in, in the uh, hallway here on the table. We've got lots of uh, envelope packs that are still here. If you've got one of those, I encourage you to, to grab hold of that. And um, uh, we've got Mr. Charles up here today. He's going to be helping us with our music. We had talked about that in a business meeting, and we're thankful that he's going to uh, be doing that. So next week, things will be even more back to normal and on an even keel. So uh, uh, be looking forward to that. Um, we've got uh, uh, several on our prayer list that we want you to keep uh, thinking about. And we're thankful to everyone that, that uh, has been a part of the meal train uh, for uh, the Jarvises and, and uh, praying for Kelly as he's navigating uh, these waters of, uh, of cancer diagnosis and, and beginning treatment. and. Uh, we're looking and, and hoping, praying for the Lord to do great things there. Uh, any other announcements before we get rolling?
exactly what we're going to do with that. We don't know yet. This is just the beginning process of getting our funds ready. So the 19th of March, we're going to have barbecue here uh, for sale like we've normally done in the past. And uh, I know we have barbecue on the bluff the 29th and 30th of April. So we'll kind of be a month ahead of that. So everybody won't have barbecue at one time. <laughs> and then uh, also I want to have a, a weekend game on the 27th of February. All right. So Y'all, the cholesterol levels will thank you for putting that a month apart. I encourage you to grab a, a church calendar. This is we, what we have tried to do is get an idea about an entire year's worth of uh, things that we know are going to be happening. So you can grab uh, one of these and have, have an idea of what's coming throughout the month. And if you're a part of a, uh, a, a committee or organization and, and there's something that you'd like to add here, I encourage you to, to let us know so we can all write those things in idea of, of what's coming and what we can look forward to. Any others? All right. Well, we're going to enjoy our prelude, and uh, during this time, I hope that you'll pray uh, together with me that God will bless us uh, in this service today and, uh, and uh, guide us as we seek to please him uh, in, in our worship this morning. <laughs> lead us in the invocation this morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It was good to be back in the house of the Lord. And, uh, yeah, this is like an experiment Sunday for me, trying to figure out, you know, how everything is set up. But uh, what I want to tell you all is that for next Sunday, what I plan to have is like little index cards or flashcards up here in your offering place. And I would like for you to, I'm going to have, um, like, if you want traditional music, if you like contemporary, you know, I want to get a, a good idea and feel of what the church would like in the future. Um, so, you know, invite your friends, family, because a good survey needs participants. And uh, I'll try to get a good gauge of you know, what the church would like. Um, but uh, starting today, we're going to start with our song of praise, The Rock of Ages. And you can sit and self-reflect, or if you'd like to stand and praise, that's fine too. But The uh, Rock of Ages.
already been mentioned, we've got lots of prayer requests. Um, I want you to be praying for uh, the Cutrels. Uh, uh, Elizabeth is, uh, as everybody knows, pregnant, and um, uh, the baby's already measuring at about seven pounds. So she's uh, she's coming along very well, uh, but uh, she. Uh, was going to be induced this week, but uh, uh, tested positive for COVID today. So uh, we want to lift them up, and pray for for both of them. Uh, first kid is always a scary time, and now to add uh, COVID to the mix is is uh, tough. And uh, so pray for them and encourage them, uh, and pray for that entire family. Uh, we want to keep on praying for for Kelly. How did things go with the doctor? This week. Good, good. We're praying for that. Praying God will just erase this stuff from his body. Any others? Tell me that name one more time. Donald Ray Bass. And so you've lost another uncle. Mm. So very unexpected. Well, we will certainly be praying for them. Any others? My niece is posting on your tracking. Uh huh. Um, this infection was a, was a blood um, infection, and they finally got to the root of the problem, and it turns out to be pretty basic and it ends up fine. So they're going to just put on some kind of plug with tomorrow. So we might be. Well, we will. Surgery for that tomorrow. Hmm. Tony McCracken, a blood infection, having surgery tomorrow. It's in his back. Any others? All right. And did I hear anybody? No. All right. Well, let's pray together. Father in heaven, you know the many requests that are not only on our prayer request list, Father, but are on our hearts and minds right now. Father, you know the cares and concerns that we are bearing. Father, we pray today that you would minister in each of these situations, circumstances. Father, uh, we, we pray that you would uh, just surround these folks with uh, your uh, power and presence. Father, we pray for your protection over uh, Elizabeth and Bradley and their baby. Uh, Father, we pray for quick healing. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would uh, just show up and show out in, in these circumstances that are beyond our control. Father, be with the many who are dealing with loss in this season, uh, the loss of loved ones. Uh, Father, we pray that you would manifest your presence and, and let them know your peace that passes understanding. Father, as a church, we pray uh, for our fellowship of believers in this place. Uh, Father, I pray that there's nothing that would uh, draw us away from you, uh, not a virus, Father, not circumstances of the world and not other uh, stuff, but uh, God, help us to love you and to love each other and to love the ministry of the saints. and. Uh, Father, as your word tells us to forsake not the gathering of ourselves together, uh, Lord, we come to this place to worship you and to be taught of you. And Father, uh, we pray that you would help the light of Jesus to go forth through your people and through the ministries of Fair Bluff Baptist Church. Father, do what only you can do in this place. Uh, we know that you are the God of this church, the God of this city, and that you are not done uh, with us yet. You have great things yet to come. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
this one I want y'all to stand up for. <laughs> so our hymn of worship comes from John 14, 19. Because I live, you also will live. So let's stand and sing hymn number 407, Because He Lives. <laughs> Because he 
right, looks like we have some special music. Uh, this is My God is Still the Same. They are still at the mention of his name They'll say my God is still the same Ask the walls If they still fall at the mighty sound of praise They'll say my God is still the same When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will my God today is probably one of the most unlikely conversions uh, that you can find within uh, the scripture. And uh, uh, we're going to look at the story of Zacchaeus uh, in uh, Luke chapter 19. So I hope that you'll turn there with me. I hope all of you have got Bibles with you this morning. Uh, one thing that I used to do every Sunday, and sometimes it got under people's skin, was I'd say, show me your Bibles. Show me your Bibles. I like seeing Bibles in hands. Bibles need to be in hands. Now, if you use your cell phone, you can hold that up too. That's okay. But you can't write on your cell phone. And I like people to take notes and to underline things that, that the Lord shows to them. Um, I'm thankful that over the last several weeks, God's been uh, allowing me to, to get through some stuff. Um, uh, you know, when uh, uh, and you hear me talk about it all the time, and some of you might be might be tired of hearing me talk about it by now, but uh, losing my dad was a tough thing. And uh, uh, we've talked about anxiety on Wednesday nights. We've talked about the, the, the issue, the very real issue of depression, and uh, none of us are immune from those things. Those are things that are kind of uh, taboo within church culture. It, it, they have been in the past, but... Uh, uh, there's things that, that I've been working through, and uh, I'm not ashamed to stand up here and tell you 
about it because there are things that, that all of us face and, and every one of us are going to need uh, some, some help to get uh, to the other side of those things. So uh, this story is one that I appreciate. Uh, Zacchaeus, uh, we, we read his story and, and you know, it, it's kind of sad that he's been remembered through history as the wee little man. Uh, but that's the story we all learn. That's the song we all learn in Sunday school. And I'm turning this mic on, so don't let anything blow up, okay? All right. Uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. You know, we don't. none of us want to be remembered uh, just for our stature. But I think the more important aspect of Zacchaeus' life is where he came from. Uh, he was a publican, just as we looked at uh, the story of, of Matthew. Uh, who was a publican. Uh, these were unlikely figures, uh, especially unlikely to follow Jesus and to follow the gospel of Jesus. But he was well-known, he was wealthy, and in this story we find that he was willing to climb a tree to get a look at this man, Jesus, who uh, said he was the Messiah. And uh, you really get a sense of his feelings if you, if you read and you think about what was happening uh, in this uh, account. You read about his conversion. It was a sudden conversion. Uh, and you read uh, the, the story again of an unlikely man, an unlikely uh, convert uh, to Jesus. And uh, you read also that his conversion was a complete conversion. There was no half measure in Zacchaeus. He may have been a man of small stature, but when he met Jesus, he was a man of, he became a man of great faith. And he immediately took the full measure uh, to seek to, to right what he had put wrong and to do what was necessary uh, to see other people come to the kingdom. So uh, if you found your place in uh, God's word in, in chapter 19 of Luke's gospel, I want you to stand with me as we begin reading in verse 1 if you're physically able. Stand with me as we read, if you're able. The scripture reads, and this is Dr. Luke, Luke the physician, very thorough in his commentary, uh, the writer of Luke, uh, Luke's gospel, and also the Acts of the Apostles. When Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, the place the walls fell down, you remember. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, not just a publican sitting in a booth, but a chief tax collector. And he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, Jesus. For he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So Zacchaeus made haste, and he came down, and re he received Jesus joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's going to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, but if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also a son of, is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Zacchaeus and for the reality, as we read last week in the story of this woman who was called sinner, a woman of repute, Today we read a story again of a sinner and we're reminded that you came not for the righteous but for the unrighteous, that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. Father, today I pray that we would see ourselves in Zacchaeus. That just as we have seen the stories of, of Nicodemus just as we've read the story of Matthew also called Levi just as we've seen the story of of this woman who came and, and anointed Jesus and washed his feet with her tears, that though each are sinners, you 
came to seek and to save those who are broken, no matter what walk of life we come from. Whether a Pharisee like Nicodemus, whether a woman of ill repute, whether a tax collector in a booth like Levi, or the chief of tax collectors like Zacchaeus. Father, speak to our hearts this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The account of a well-known, wealthy, publican, tax collector who came to get a look at Jesus. We see a great many things that we can identify with in Zacchaeus. How did it happen? Uh, I think a, a better uh, title for this message would probably be how to be saved and, and know that you're saved or uh, the story of an unlikely uh, convert. When we listen to the story of Zacchaeus, we see the story and we understand how it is that we come to be saved. But when we're speaking to someone else who is seeking Jesus, how is it that we direct that person to Christ? And I think Zacchaeus' story provides us with a great example of how to point someone to Jesus. The first thing you find true in, in the life of Zacchaeus was that he meant business. Again, no half measures with this man. He might have been a small man in stature, but he was large in his determination to get to Jesus. G Zacchaeus wasn't just curious to see who Jesus was, but when we look at verses 2 and 3, we find that he, Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, was very rich. He sought to see who Jesus was, but he couldn't because of the crowd, for he was of short stature, so he ran ahead and climbed into the sycamore tree. Zacchaeus, even though he perhaps had everything the world could offer, he had everything that wealth could offer, he was very dissatisfied with life, no doubt. And he came and he sought out this opportunity, what may have been his only opportunity to see Jesus. You have a Savior who is seeking the lost, and you have a lost man who is seeking the Savior. It was a good thing that he was determined, that he was quick in his action. When we come to know Jesus, there is a determination that the Holy Spirit bears up within us. There, there is a determination that comes from God for the sinner to get to the Savior. If we've never known the reality of that determination, then it is doubtful that we have ever known the Savior. God moves us toward Himself through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that He awakens us to the reality of our sin and our deep-seated need, the reality of a deep-seated need and a yearning for a Savior. Zacchaeus no doubt had that need, that dissatisfaction with life, and he was willing to overcome the obstacles necessary to get there. The Bible says that he ran ahead, he climbed into a sycamore tree to see him. You would imagine that this was a guy that probably previously walked through life with his head held high, dignified, you know, just as the Pharisees. They walked around like they owned the world in their self-righteousness. This was a guy who owned the world because of the riches he possessed. We talked about the publicans, how they would rob the people in the name of the emperor. They not only got, got the emperor's pound of flesh, but they got a pound of flesh for themselves too. They took from the people. He would have perhaps or could have thought of himself as being above it all, being better than everyone else. But you see this man throw his dignity to the dogs and run ahead to see the Savior. Sometimes we need to forget about our, our 
so-called dignity. We need to forget about our, our self-righteousness and di our dignity is rooted in our pride. We think, well, if I, if I do such and such, if I let people know that, that God is, is leading me to do this or, or that I, I, I need Jesus, it, it's going to hurt my, my dignity. It's going to hurt my standing in the eyes of people. What a mess we find ourselves in when that's the way we think of things. It's a mess that affects our eternal destination. You got to forget and forget dignity, forget pride and realize that we don't have anything without Jesus. Zacchaeus forgot about all the worldly junk and he ran ahead and he climbed that tree so that he could see Jesus. There were a great many reasons that he could have given for not seeking Jesus. Well, I'm not going to follow all those common paupers to, to go and see this guy that doesn't even have a place to lay his head. But he did it. And it paid off in eternal dividends. He could have said he's too well known. The crowd's too big. I'm too short. What will my family say, what will my neighbors say? But Zacchaeus again overcame his pride, which is his greatest hindrance and your greatest hindrance and mine. And he overcame the obstacles to come into a saving relationship with Jesus. Sometimes the obstacle and, and the obstacle, the greatest obstacle in this story isn't the one that's mentioned. The greatest obstacle in Zacchaeus' life wasn't that sycamore tree. The greatest obstacle in Zacchaeus' life was Zacchaeus. Human pride. A rich man. A rich man. An unlikely convert. A man who had lived, lived by, by disenfranchising and ripping people off in the name of the emperor. But this is the man we find coming to Jesus that day. You and I have got to mean business with Jesus. You and I have got to have determination to seek him. That determination comes through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, awakening us to the reality that we are sinners. Just as the Apostle John wrote, he that says he's without sin has sinned all ready. Jesus said, if you've offended in one point of the law, you've offended in them all in the eyes of a holy God. No matter how good or how great we think we are, we are nothing without Jesus. There are obstacles to be overcome. Most of the time, those obstacles are the obstacles that we face within ourselves. You and I have to receive Jesus. What does that mean? What does it mean to receive Jesus? We hear that terminology. We hear a lot of Christianese in our culture, in the church culture especially. Well, you've got to open up your heart and receive Jesus. Well, what in the world do you mean by that? I, am I supposed to open my chest up and say, come on in? What does that mean? It means seeing sin from God's perspective and understanding that we are headed toward a devil's hell, the reality of an eternity spent separated from God. Brokenness because of sin and our calling upon Him. God, I see my sin and I see what an offense it is to you. And today, I declare my faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God sent to earth to die on Calvary's cross, to be raised from the dead early on the third day, and to stand in victory over death, hell, and the grave. He is my only salvation. He's my only way to get to you. And without Him, I have nothing before you. It's an opening of ourselves to the reality of what God says about mankind. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says that every one of us, that all of us, have turned away from God. 
He says, there is none righteous, no, not even one. They have all turned away. He says, their mouths are open sepulchers. No matter how good we might think we are without Jesus, the reality is that we are still just as much the sinner as the next person without Him. And just as much headed for hell without Him. You and I have to mean business. It's not just coming up and praying a prayer that somebody tells you to pray. It's not just getting dunked in the baptismal water. It is knowing the reality of who God is and what He says about sin. Falling before Jesus. Zacchaeus received Jesus. You and I have to receive him. He might have been shocked when he saw Jesus stop at his tree that day. But again, an illustration of the fact that God knows us individually. Whether it's the man by the pool of Bethesda, whether it's the woman at the well. Jesus knew Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus ever knew Jesus. Jesus stops and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. A chief tax collector. Up a tree, no doubt. What a sight that must have been. Jesus stops and he says, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down for today. I'm coming to your house. Zacchaeus immediately responds. And the people immediately had something to say. He was hated by most people. It's surprising to these people that Jesus would stop and speak to this man and tell him, today I'm coming to your house. But I think it's also surprising how quickly this man who had stood in authority over other people for so long, who had willingly taken from people for so long in the name of the emperor, of Rome. The Bible says he made haste and he came down and he received Jesus joyfully. Zacchaeus meant business. He overcame some obstacles. He climbed that tree so he could get a view of Jesus. He received Jesus joyfully. We not only get pictures in the Bible of people who respond immediately to Jesus and who do everything necessary to make themselves to be in alignment with him. But when we look at the book of of Mark, Mark chapter 10 tells us the story of the rich young ruler and Jesus had blessed the children and all of these things that had been going on and Jesus was going out to the road and one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love that that statement. Looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Blew this man's mind. He comes and he says, teacher, what shall I do? But there was one thing that he was not willing to do, and that was part with earthly treasure. Why? Because earthly treasure was his God. The Bible says that the man was sad at the word of Jesus and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. The rich young ruler left the presence of Jesus though Jesus looked upon him and loved him. He was unwilling to do what was necessary to get to Jesus. 
Jesus looked at his disciples and said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. This was the, young, the rich young ruler's problem. He trusted in his wealth more than he trusted in God. His wealth was his security. His security was not in the reality of God, not in the reality that God takes care of those who, be, who, who follow him and belong to him. He wasn't willing to follow the path of Jesus, which the Bible tells us, uh, it was said of him, foxes have holes, the earth, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He says, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I had a lady in my past. I'm not going to tell you where in my past. Wasn't here. I'll tell you that much. Who is wealthy? Wealthy. And she was known for writing big checks to the church. And because of that, there were people that great, gave great deference to this lady. And she was a nice enough person. But when it came down to it, she thought her money was her standing with God. And there was something that happened, and she came to me and essentially said, if such and such doesn't happen the way that I want it to happen, I'll take my money and I'll go elsewhere. And I said, let me get you a bag. You and I have nothing before God. That's astounding for some of us to even wrap our minds around that we have nothing before God but Jesus. And the church exists for the singular purpose of bringing people to him. So what should be your response and mind to the security that we find in earthly wealth? And means. Well, God blesses some of us greatly, and that's a good thing. But when those blessings stand in the way of authenticity before God, then those things are not helps, they're hindrances. I've known some people that have been blessed with great wealth that have done great things for the kingdom of God. I think about Mr. Grady Workman. He owned DEGE Metals, was a multi, multi-millionaire. But he realized his money wasn't his standing with Jesus. And it wasn't his standing with God. He realized that what he had, what God had trusted him with, was to be used as a tool for the kingdom. And he used what he had to build housing for missionaries. And, you know, he left this world a lot better for his having been here. He was a treasurer of the Jesse Crooks Evangelistic Association, which I was on the, am on the board of directors for. You see the difference between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler. Zacchaeus, he climbed over the obstacles. Most of the time those obstacles are within ourselves, and the biggest one is pride. And he went to Jesus. John chapter 1 says he was in the world. The world was made by him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Paul in 2 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to read this and I'm going to be quiet here in a minute. 
He said, this is the third time I'm coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time, now being absent. I write to those of you who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. You seek proof of Christ speaking in me who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. The people were, were questioning his apostolic credentials, essentially. And he says, I'm coming. And he tells us again that First and Second Corinthians aren't the only correspondence he had with the church at Corinth. He says, I'm coming to you a third time. So obviously, this wasn't the only letter, letter he wrote. But he makes this statement in verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Prove yourselves. You read in the King James Version. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? He says, examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Metallurgical Language he's using, if you look back at the original language, Greek. It was the same language that was used of those who are purifying gold by fire. What happens when you pull gold out of the ground or have gold ore that, that you uh, take in? It, it's got to be put in a crucible and it's got to be melted down and all of the impurities rise to the top in this stuff called slag. And it's scraped away. He's essentially saying, take the faith that you claim to have, Corinthians, put it in the crucible and put it in the fire and make sure that it's the genuine article. Make sure that what you claim to have is the pure stuff. My son has got a, a box full of, full of rocks that his aunt sent him. And uh, in one of these packages, he got pyrite. You know what pyrite is? Fool's gold. Fool's gold. How many of us have been fooled with the pyrite of the Christian culture? The fool's gold of the Christian culture. We can be initiated into the, the, the language of the Christian culture. We can be initiated into... The, the mannerisms and, and the things uh, of, of the church and still be as far away from Jesus as the sinner on the street. I don't want the fool's gold of faith. I'd like to have the genuine article. And Paul says, put to test. Make sure that what you've got is what John writes of in John chapter 1, that that. He comes, but as many as received Him, to them He gives the right to become the children of God. Receive Jesus. Receive the truth. That's what Jesus is called in John chapter 1, the logos. It's the root word of logic. Receive the truth of who He is and who He says we are. That's what it means to receive Jesus. Understand sin from God's perspective. Understand our standing without Jesus, understand our standing without sin as sinners. He says, prove yourselves. We don't need the faith of the rich young ruler. That when the, the test came, when the requirement came, he wasn't willing. Revelation chapter 3 says, as many as I love, I rebuke. And I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So, what we find Zacchaeus doing, being zealous and repenting. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I believe Jesus is, is speaking to the, the church at Sardis. When he, when he says this, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. There is this, this picture that Jesus makes here. He, he 
tells us it's as if he's standing behind a closed door and he's knocking. But the requirement is that you and I must open the door. And that means we receive who is on the other side. We receive them for who they are and what they declare. I see this where Jesus stands at the door, but I also think about the story of Cain and Abel. And before Cain commits the murder of his brother, the Lord speaks to Cain and he says, Cain, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. Its desire is to overcome you, to overwhelm you, to destroy you, but you must master it. What happens? Sin overcomes, overwhelms, and destroys. Cain murders his brother and is cast out. No one who has received Jesus, no one who has not received Jesus is a Christian. If you and I would be saved, we must receive, accept, and welcome him into our lives. And that is a very personal matter. Look at verse 6. So he made haste. Zacchaeus makes haste and comes down and receives Jesus joyfully. He made haste, came down, and welcomes Jesus with gladness. You see the difference between the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus? Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and he loved him, and yet the rich young ruler went away that day sad and broken unwilling to do what was necessary. You and I have got to be willing, willing to seek God with determination to overcome the obstacles, to receive Jesus, to make him the Lord of our lives. We've got to be ready to face criticism and opposition the opposition wasn't just directed at Zacchaeus. It was directed at Jesus. The people were mad. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Thank God he is willing to be the guest of individuals who are sinners. Zacchaeus was at the center of this Story. The people muttered, but Zacchaeus took his stand with Jesus. It meant being a target for the criticism and misunderstanding of the crowd. They were not excited about the fact that Zacchaeus was coming to Jesus. How many people are in our world today that cannot see Jesus for the crowd? All of those who are gathered around Jesus who say that we are followers of His who want to be a part of what He's doing and yet sometimes we can be just as much an obstacle as the pride within the sinner themselves. Sometimes those who are around Jesus are just as much sinners and lost as Zacchaeus was. There was an excitement in these people. To see Zacchaeus come to Jesus? No, there was only criticism for Zacchaeus. I've been in church situations before where, where I've heard people called undesirables. Well, we can't go over there to, to tell people to come to our church because there's a bunch of undesirables that live there. You didn't get much more undesirable in Jewish culture than Zacchaeus was. You might have found a publican just a little above the position of a leper or a prostitute like the woman we looked at last week. Whatever her sin was, she was an undesirable. And yet that is exactly the individual we find Jesus coming and interacting with. Be ready for criticism. Be ready for opposition. When the gospel of Christ, when the true gospel is preached, there are inevitably people who stand up in opposition to it. The Pharisees stand up and they say, what in the world, like Simon did? What in the world? 
are you doing with those people? Or they're like the crowd that had gathered around Jesus and obstructed Zacchaeus' view. What in the world is he doing with that man? Zacchaeus took his stand with Jesus. It's not possible to become a real Christian without experiencing some measure of persecution and opposition. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Don't expect the culture to embrace what is, what is completely foreign to it. We live in a culture that celebrates and embraces sin. When the gospel meets the brokenness, when salt meets the wound, it burns. I love John 16, That has been one, one of the verses I've called my life verse that I have clung to and held on to through some of the most difficult circumstances of my life. And Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have Peace, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Those who follow Jesus need to be ready to overcome. Philippians chapter 1, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but to also suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me. It inevitably comes. In Luke chapter 14, I know I lied. I didn't mean to keep going, but I'm going to keep going for just a minute. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What's Jesus saying? There are people who have read that verse and thought, my goodness, how in the world could someone be so selfish as that? Now what Jesus is saying is that there is nothing, God Himself in human flesh, there is nothing more valuable, not my mother, not my father, not my children, not my grandchildren, there is nothing more valuable to the eternal soul of an individual than Jesus Himself is. And he says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to love me, you've got to realize that I come before everything else. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation and, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able, to, he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes again and with, against him with 20? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask conditions of peace. Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That is strong language. But it's the cost of authentic discipleship. Jesus is not just a passing glance in your life. He's not just a, a, a friend we pass on the road and we throw up our hand and say hello. Jesus is Lord or he is nothing. You and I. Be ready to face opposition, but understand 
the cost of discipleship, the willingness to confess Jesus before others. Zacchaeus didn't go and hide. He had no intention of being a secret disciple. He didn't come by night like Nicodemus did. But like the woman called sinner, he comes to Jesus and he stands just as she washed his feet in the home of a Pharisee who would condemn her. Zacchaeus stands in front of the crowd, a willing, obedient follower, not a secret disciple. He at once identified himself with Jesus, and he openly acknowledged Jesus as his Savior and friend. If we confess with our mouth, I quote you Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 quite often. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. There is value in public profession. You and I have got to be willing to obey. Zacchaeus immediately did what Jesus asked of him. He said, I'm coming to your house. And Zacchaeus went and he made ready for Jesus to come. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because he, Zacchaeus, also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. As soon as Jesus said what he said there in verse 9, Zacchaeus knew that he was saved. And that is the only way to gain assurance of salvation is to rest upon the word of Jesus. What God says he means. What God says he means. When, when we find a promise in God's word, it's a promise that we can, we can rest our lives on, we can build our lives on. The Bible says that that day, salvation came to his house. When you and I come to Jesus in faith knowing that we're sinners and our only avenue to salvation is through him, then we come and we cling to the truth of God's word. What happens is real. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the story of Zacchaeus that in our brokenness, you have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Father, this is a message that somebody needs to hear today. It's a message that I need to hear in my heart, to be reminded of the reality that you came for people who were broken. Every person under the sound of my voice today is broken in some way, shape, or form. How grateful we are that you are a healer of the broken. Father, be with us during this short time of invitation. If there's one person in this place today that cannot say when their faith is put to the test that it's the genuine article, then today let that become a reality in their life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a short, short invitation hymn. And uh, if God's working in your heart today, I hope that you'll be obedient to his leadership as we sing. Hymn number 321.
look at our faith and we can be assured 